I don't think that smiling is something which is against the precepts or which is something that's going to obstruct the meditation. And only real meditators, they never smile. And in fact, in all the years I've been a monk, and even before, but especially being a monk, the only people I've seen who never smile I'm in coffins. <laughs> so don't be like dead meditator sitting. A little smile is an important part of the path. And I quote this so often. The Dhamma Chedya Sutta. I think what he mentioned it last night, but it's important to reinforce. When King Pesayvadi, one of the great disciples of the Buddha, who lived just outside of the Jetavana monastery, the Jeta Grove, outside of Savati, when he he had the Buddha staying so close, literally within walking distance from the city. So in the afternoon, evening, having finished his work, with all the stress and problems of a king, he would go and see the Buddha, someone he could relate to without the Buddha feeling that he wanted to get out of some, uh, get something out of the king, to get some contract or some privilege. <coughs> so the Buddha wasn't interested in that at all. So the Buddha was a beautiful friend of a king, and always like a, a father or a grandfather to the king even though they were of the same age. And just before King Pasenadi was about to die, he went to see the Buddha, and uh, he went into the Buddha's hut, and he started kissing the Buddha's feet. Now it's really uh, rare, and even weird, because Buddha was his teacher. Imagine that, um, I imagine Queen Elizabeth started kissing the feet of the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> that would be fairly weird indeed. But this was a, a mark of respect to somebody who had given so much inspiration, guidance and peace to the busy life of a king. And then afterwards they had a conversation and said, why, why do you always like coming into this Jaita Grove Monastery, Your Majesty. And it was at that point where a statement which I will always remember because it just reaffirmed what I felt in my heart about meditation. He said, I love coming into this monk's monastery as a Jaita Wana because all the monks I see, whether they're meditating or walking, always smiling and happy. And the Buddha replied, yes, that's what you can expect when people are meditating properly and gaining insights, a lessening of suffering, a relief of that timeless attention, and a great deal of what we call in meditation, Piti Sukha, so joy and happiness, joy and happiness of either for liberation or on the path of liberation. It's an important part of the path. So, when happiness comes up, you don't need to speak, but you are certainly allowed to smile and even laugh. Sometimes the laughter is full. It's something which comes naturally. Sometimes there may be tears, the toy of tears of joy, of inspiration, which comes up because it's a sign that the mind is recognizing a beautiful path of freedom and liberation and peace, which transcends old age, sickness and even death, real deep peace and happiness. So when those things happen, please do not suppress them. An example of that was some one of the retreats I was teaching in Australia about three or four years ago. 
in the interviews, an Australian man, about you know, 40 years of age. He was really concerned because he'd started crying during the meditation. And he couldn't stop it. And he said, what am I crying for? I don't feel sad. And then I asked him, when was the last time he cried? To which he replied, when he was about 11 or 12. And his father in Australia said, Australian boys don't cry. That's it, he's, up. he's got a lot of crying to catch up on. <laughs> and he did let go. He did allow those tears to come just throughout almost the whole rest of the, the five or six days of the retreat. And did anyone mind that he was making a little bit of a noise? No, they had so much compassion and kindness for him. They let it be, and the noise never disturbed him. It's something that any psychologist, any therapist knows. Too often we sort of we think that this is how we should do things. This is what a man should be. This is what a mark, what a nun, or a lay person, a father, a grandfather, whatever. We actually play roles when they're not appropriate for that time and place. And the same happens within meditation. Our job in meditation is to take away those controls, <coughs> take away those what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, and do nothing. Another option of just sitting here, of just being here, and just letting things settle down. When we do such things, we do get to what we call the deep meditation state. Remember or recall or just can notice that what I've been saying is almost like I'm not doing. It's just getting out of the way and letting this process of meditation happen. Jhanas occurring naturally. Which is one of the reasons why when I came into this hall yesterday I was quite taken with the red lights. The reason why I like the red lights is not because that this is a symbol of the red light district of Belsay Bridge. <laughs> At least I hope not. But anyway, what it does mean is a symbol of the traffic lights which tells you to stop. Stop. And if a person or a car or a train stops at the red light, what happens? Slows down and comes to a halt and becomes still. It's not moving, not going anywhere. It's just being there. And so often in life, we always think that to achieve our goal, to reach our destination, we always have to have green lights. Always going, 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 and going, 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 going. And I know that once somebody asked me, a child asked me, he said, in Buddhism, what do you believe? Where does a person go when they die? And I answered, only one or two places, the graveyard or the crematorium. <laughs> That's where the body goes. So where are you going to? I'll tell you where you're going. The graveyard or the crematorium. And sometimes I get caught out when somebody came up to me once and said, Ajahn Brown, how's it going? And the normal answer was, I'm getting there. Have you ever said that? I'm getting there. What a stupid answer that is. Because they knew more than me. And they said, where exactly is it you're getting to, Ajahn Brown? <laughs> Caught me. <laughs> where are you getting to in life? 
sometimes another achievement, another sort of experience, another either um, personal, um, personal, academic, um, whatever it's business, relationship, just another achievement which you think, wow, I've been there, I've made it, I've made it. What have you made? Because whatever you've made, whatever you've achieved, it crumbles as soon as you get a certificate. It starts to decay and wear away. It's not a real achievement at all. So here, we are not going to go against that stream. The stream is trying to get something, trying to go somewhere, trying to be somebody, trying to have another achievement to put on our CV. My CV. I have a degree. I have a business. I have uh, been a CEM of so many monasteries. You know what CEM means, don't you? Chief Executive Monk. She's a CEM. Chief Executive Monk. <laughs> Is that the sort of CV you want to add to by saying, yes, Chief Executive Monk of Ankapa Bikuni Ordination. Or no, Bikuni Totem. Chief Executive Organiser of Retreats in Ankapabikuni Project. Chief Executive, instead of trying to be something which you sort of put on a CV, how about Chief Loser? <laughs> <laughs> if I had a CV now, that's what I would put on it. I know in Australia, I'm sure this must happen here in, in UK, because most of the TV programs or stuff, they try it out here first of all, and then it goes to Australia, very rarely the other way. Do you have a program on TV called The Biggest Loser? You have that one? Who is The Biggest Loser? Here. <laughs> Just behind. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we think being a loser is being a failure. But in meditation, we look at it in a totally opposite way. We go against that type of stream of attainments. We see how much we can lose. Not being a winner, but a loser. To lose, number one. All your past and your future. To be peaceful by yourself. When I go and teach all over the place, I get invited to some very interesting conferences, seminars, which at first glance have nothing at all to do with Buddhism or meditation. But one of those was in a hospital in Singapore was presenting at a uh, dementia and Alzheimer's conference. And my fellow presenter was a Buddhist doctor I'd known him for a while. That was, he was a professor of that area. And when he was asked to just define, you know, in brief, so everyone could understand just what basically the signs of dementia are, and he replied, it means that you're not really concerned about the past. You don't really worry about the future. And you're socially disengaged. That's me. <laughs> and I've been teaching people to become demented. <laughs> to let go of the past and not worry about the future. <laughs> And stay in your rooms and be socially disengaged and don't even talk to one another. It's my fault. But obviously there's a difference between dementia and being peaceful. But anyway, there is a sense of losing 
some of those terrible attachments which we have. So, the first little exercise, simple exercise for everyone. And I'm going to ask you, don't change your posture, okay? Close your eyes. As soon as I'm going to do some meditation, people have to change this and put their... Yes, yes, you are. Now, with your eyes closed, imagine you're carrying two heavy suitcases. Like I saw many of you do yesterday. But if not suitcases, shopping bags. We've done that many times. Walking down long, long country roads. Your arms ache and your shoulders hurt. Imagine that, feel that, visualize it. You've done it many times before, so you know what it feels like. It hurts. It aches. And then imagine looking in on the bag in your left hand. And you look on the outside of that big heavy bag. And it's got the four letters, P-A-S-T, the past. And you peer inside that bag, it hasn't got no shopping, bread and, and uh, tea or whatever. It's got your past in there. All of your memories, even though you have many beautiful, good, happy memories, we tend to stuff our painful memories our unfinished business, our pain in the bag and our left hand. And it's very, very heavy. Just like a real shopping bag filled to the brim. It wears your left arm down. The past makes your brain very tired and your heart too weak to really have fun and have joy. And then you, in your imagination, look at the bag in your right hand. That has the letters F-U-T-U-R-E on the outside. This is your future. In that bag you have so many plans, hopes, dreams, anxieties and fears in that bag. You've been carrying that around for so many years. It was a real bag. Your arms and shoulders would be really in pain. Because they are fears, anxieties for your future. That even more makes your brain exhausted. It makes your heart have no energy. It's weighed down by worries and fears and anxieties and a few hopes as well. And you can feel the weight of those two bags representing your past and your future. And now you imagine leaning to the left, which is what you do when you lower a bag to the ground. You lean to the left. And slowly, gradually, you lower the bag representing your past to the ground. And when it does meet the floor, the weight goes. There's no burden. And you imagine uncurling your fingers, which allows you to straighten up your back, lift up your arm and hand, so it's resting, resting by your side. You've let go of the past. And then you, <coughs> you look in your imagination and the back in your right hand, the future. That really is heavy. That's been tiring you. It stops you skipping and dancing and laughing through life. And you lean to the right. As you lean to the right, you lower the bag in your right hand, representing your future, closer and closer to the ground. And when it meets the ground, 
a burden, a weight, a heaviness of anxiety. It's relieved, it grows, it vanishes. And that allows you to let go of the bag representing your future. And as your hand moves away, as you stop grasping your future, you straighten up your back, your right hand starts to rest by your right side, relaxing, it still aches, it's been hurt, but now, moment by moment, it relaxes, heals, and energizes. And in this little visualization, imagine gazing at those two bags on the left and on the right. No one will take them away yet. So you don't have to be afraid that someone's going to take them away. Strange. It would be wonderful if someone took them away. <laughs> but we pretty much are connected to them. And we feel a responsibility. So you don't need to worry because they're right there. To be picked up later on. But now is the time for resting, for re-energizing. And you imagine yourself just looking down those two heavy bags and you are standing in this wonderful place of freedom. Right between the past and the future. That's where you stand. That is what we call the present moment, the now. No past, no future. No waiting down by any past ideas, successes, failures. Not concerned with the jobs and duties of the future. Let that go. It will look after itself. That's why we call it a natural way. Not what you do, but what you make of. What you don't do. What the red light is telling you. Stop. Put things down, park your vehicle, and relax. So you can open your eyes now. So that's a visualization, which is a wonderful thing to do at the start of any meditation. Or, if you're working, if you are um, struggling with anything at home, is something which you can always do to come back into the present moment. It is a letting go. I was told this a long time ago by a disciple that India used to be a very powerful spiritual nation and still they have a little bit of innovation. I thought first of all this was in Mumbai, but apparently it was found in Chennai that at their traffic intersections they had the red lights, the amber lights and green lights. But when, when the traffic light went to red, instead of the words STOP, they had a different words, which spelled R-E-L-A-X. Not stop, but relax. So they were never called stop signs. They were called relax signs. <laughs> and I thought, how cool is that? Because stop is, oh, I'm supposed to be doing something. And your pressure just builds and builds and builds as you anticipate the changing of the lights. Is it going to change yet? Come on, come on, come on, come on. It brings you more tension. But to have relax lights. Imagine if the British government did that on every intersection of this country. Instead of stop, you have relaxed 
lights. Which is why when I look at those red lights, it doesn't signify to me stop. It signifies to me relax. Which is an important part of the meditation. When we relax, we let go of the past and the future. And we become here. There was one of my favourite stories. I don't know how many of you have heard this, probably all of you, but that will not stop me. <laughs> but this was an important story. Sometimes we have stories from the, the Buddhist texts, but this one was told to me by a Middle Eastern gentleman in an airport many years ago. And I always wondered where the heck this came from. And somebody found it in a short story by the Sufi poet Rumi. And the story was of the, the, monk, the, the monk and the, the poor farmer. And it's wonderful that this obviously was a Buddhist influence in Iran. Or if, you, if the sun's in your eyes over there, you know, please, if you, you can move over if you wish because the poor thing is getting too much sun there. Now you know what monks and nuns feel like when they get photographed, flash, 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 flash. <laughs> you okay? Is there a spare chair up here if you want to come up here? <coughs> so anyway... No. <laughs> oh, that's even better. Excellent. Well done. Anyway, so the, there was an old monk and in the tradition of um, uh, Buddhism, the, the monks would go wandering from place to place in the right time of the year so that they could you know, live out into, under the trees by the, the rivers. I just had hardly anything, we're now seeing so much and it was a very, uh, one of those times in my life which I look back on with so much gratitude and so much happiness. In my sixth year as a monk, we were encouraged to leave the monastery and just go, just walk. And had everything I ever owned, just my bowl, spare robe, and a few other things, carried on my back. I had some shoes, but after a while, you know, who needs shoes, I just gave them away. And just walking through Thailand, knowing wherever you got to the next morning, you could always go in the village and go for arms round and get with some rice, something to eat. And it was a very beautiful time when you owned hardly anything, and you were like a bird. I'd come to a crossroads, and I could go any which way, straight ahead, left, right, or even turn around and go back again. I had no appointments, nowhere to go, no destination, just total freedom. And to me that was so beautiful, so delightful, that it reminded me just of how we can meditate as well, this for the time being, just totally let go. No nothing to call your home, no destination, no work. You had everything you needed. Just a bowl for your food the next day, a little water jar you know, for your drinking water, and a oh, mosquito net. We go in the jungle and just uh, meditate or just sleep. It's a beautiful time. And anyway, there was a tradition so many years ago, there was a very old monk doing the same. And you would go to anywhere and they would feed you. It didn't cost much to feed a monk. And so this uh, old monk came to an old farmer's house. And the old farmer, he said, I'm a Buddhist, please let me give you some food for the day. And put some food in the old monk's bowl. And at the end of that, the farmer said, um, old monk, have you got anywhere to stay for the rainy season? Because you know, in the tradition of uh, in Asia, 
the monsoons come in July, August, September, October, and you do need a place to stay. So he said, the old one said, I haven't accepted the place yet. At which the old one went down on the ground. So it was the old farm, the farmer went down to the ground and asked the old monk, please accept an invitation to stay with me for the next few months. I'm not rich, I'm a farmer, and I can very easily supply you your food. And there's a nice meadow next to a river, just a small distance from here. And it's easy to build you a small little hut. And all I would ask in return is when you come for alms food, Please, if you ever want to give us some advice or help us with our meditation. I have two kids and maybe you can teach them a little, little um, good bit of advice. And that's all I'd ask in return. And the old monk said, okay. So that old monk stayed with his family, the farmer, his wife, two little children, and also had a dog as well. And after three months, they benefited so much and from the advice of just the presence of a very kind and frugal monk that when he came up to them and said the retreat period is over, I'm going to leave tomorrow the farmer was devastated he started crying and even the wife cried the two children started bawling and even the dog started whining <laughs> they got to love the beautiful monk over those three months but that's when the old man said, Thank you so much for looking after me, but I have to go tomorrow. But, in my meditation, I have seen some very, very, I've got some very good powers. And I have seen that not far from here, closer than you think, there is a huge treasure buried under the ground. Of course, I don't need that money, I'm a monk. But I want you to have it. I don't want to see you in, in such poverty. I want your, your wife and you to have a nice house and your children to get a good education. Even your dog, who's just you know, such a nice dog, you know, to have a, a beautiful kennel and good food. But said the, said the monk, you have to follow my instructions. Totally. What are they? And the uh, old, the old farmer, the wife, even the kids, and the dog, dog picked on his ears <laughs> to listen. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, said the old man, I want you to get up before dawn. I want you to stand at the doorway of your hut and wait for the sun to rise. Just before the sun rises, pick up that bow and arrow you used to hunt. This is many years ago. Stand at the doorway and point the bow and arrow in the direction of the rising sun. And when the disk of the sun separates from the horizon, let the arrow fly. And where that arrow falls, there, guaranteed, he will find the treasure. And then he left. And the family, even though they missed the old monk, they realised, because old monks don't lie, that the following day they'll be rich. So they were up so early in the morning, really early, just waiting and waiting. And when the sun started to rise above the horizon, the farmer took up the bow and arrow. He pointed it in the direction of the rising sun, waiting, waiting. And as soon, as soon as the sun parted from the horizon, he shot the arrow. And they all ran after it. And this was a long time ago. So the wife had to dig the hole. <laughs> Don't worry, the guy gets it later. <laughs> it's called karma. <clears throat> so she dug and she dug and she dug 
And what were the arrow fell? And what did she find? Nothing. Only trouble. Because that piece of land belonged to a very powerful lawyer. And the lawyer just happened to be coming past on a morning stroll. And he said, what are you doing? That's my land. You can't do that. And my wife, in the bottom of the hole in the shop, said, he told me to. <laughs> you farmer, what are you doing that for? That's illegal. He said, oh, no, no. The farmer said, I'm going to sue you. I'm going to sue you for everything you've got. No, 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 no. He said, an old monk told me to, that we find a big treasure here. And those two words, treasure, an old monk, the lawyer stopped. You know when you have a photograph of lawyers? How do you make lawyers smile when they have a photograph taken? You don't say cheese. You say, fees. <laughs> If there's any lawyers here, please don't sue. They've got that money anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the old the lawyer said, Oh monk, an old monk said this, you'll find a treasure here, because I'm a Buddhist too, said the lawyer. And old monks don't lie, what did they tell you? And when the farmer told the instructions, the lawyer said, Ah, you just don't understand anything. He said, I'll do a deal. Tomorrow I will shoot that arrow. And I will split the proceeds. 51% to me, 49 for you, less costs. <laughs> it's always costs. And so they signed the contract, because lawyers have their own contract signed. And the following morning, the lawyer was there to go with the farmer, his wife, or the two children as well, and the dog. And this time, the, the lawyer waited till the sun to rise. And when the sun rose, he picked up the bow and arrow and he pointed the bow and arrow in the direction of the rising sun. He shot the arrow in the direction of the rising sun and it went much further. So they all ran after it. The farmer, his wife, of course the lawyer, the two children and the dog. And where the arrow fell, this time it was the husband's, the farmer's job to actually to dig the hole. You tell someone else to do it today, you don't have to do it yourself tomorrow. That's called karma. So anyway, <coughs> there the, uh, the farmer dug the hole. He dug and dug and dug and dug. And what did he find? Nothing, only more trouble. Because this time the arrow fell in a field belonging to the general in the army. And he was riding past with some of his troops. He said, what are you doing? That is my field. You can't just dig wherever you like. And he said, soldiers, cut off their heads. All of them, including that dog. The poor dog. <laughs> but, the husband, it's not my fault. The lawyer told me to do it. No, no, not me, not me. It's the old monk's fault. The old monk said we find a treasure here. General said, put your swords away. I'm a Buddhist too. Now don't argue and discuss what a general who gets people's heads cut off is doing being a Buddhist. <laughs> but anyway, so he said, I'm a Buddhist too. And old monks don't mind. What did they tell you? And when he heard it was all about shooting an arrow, he said, look, you are lay people. What do you know about shooting arrows? You've got to be in the military. I've trained all my life in archery. Let me shoot the arrow tomorrow morning. I have great faith that must be a treasure there somewhere. And we're spiritual three ways. So, the following morning, the general was there. And as the sun rose, he took up the bow and arrow. As it rose above the horizon, he shot the arrow in the direction of the rising sun. And it went so far, even the poor old dog running after it was panting, let alone the lawyer was really fat. And where it landed, this time it was the lawyer's job to dig the hole. While the general watched, and the lawyer dug, and dug, and dug, and this time 
What did he find? Nothing. Only even more trouble. Because this time, it's amazing this is an Islamic story, but from the Sufi tradition. This time they found big trouble because they were digging a hole in the king's own garden. And the king's royal guards came and arrested them all and brought them in front of his majesty. And his majesty said, General, you of all people should know better. You are my best soul, my, one of my best generals, but I have to apply the law without any preference. You know destroying royal property is a capital offence. You will have to be executed together with your accomplices. The lawyer, the lawyer said, I appeal. <laughs> Sorry, no appeal. And the farmer, his wife, and the two children, even the poor dog, because he was there on the site of the crime as well. It all had to be executed. And that was when the lawyer said, please, sir, 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 your majesty, an old monk said we'll find a treasure here. And at that, the king said, did you say, old oh, monk? Because I am a Buddhist too, said the king. <laughs> and old monks don't lie. What did he tell you? And they told him the instructions how to find the treasure. And even kings, not only do they have faith, but they always try and find some way of getting some more taxes. I don't know, as I said, in the UK, you haven't got enough revenue coming in to the, to the tax office. Is that the case? In Australia it is anyway, because there was this guy who went to one of these pubs one evening, after work, and it was one of these really rough pubs. It was owned by a former professional wrestler, and all these like Hells Angels and weightlifters, that's, that's where they met for the evening. It's a very rough bar. But, this guy was really thin, in a suit, in a tie and a bald head. Not bald like this, but you know, just, just you know, losing his hair, maybe 50 or 60. And, he said, I want a drink. The big bartender, just, you could saw behind him, there was a standing competition. If once a bartender, a former professional wrestler, if he could squeeze a lemon, you know, for sort of some drink, and if anyone else after the bartender squeezed the lemon could get even one drop out of that lemon, they'd get free drinks for the rest of the night. And this scrawny little fellow said, I'd like to try this. And they laughed, and look at the size of it, it was so thin. All the other people are really fat and strong, they're weightlifters. They go to the gym, they train, they work out. He said, I want to try it. And this Bartender got a half a lemon and he squoze and he pulverized it. He just drained it. It was like there's nothing left in it at all. And then he gave it to this scrawny thin guy. This scrawny thin guy took it in his hand. Everyone was watching and they could believe it as he squoze it first one drop, then two drops, then three, four, five drops come out. So that was a miracle. Really tough, strong guys can do that. So they had to ask him, we've never seen that before. You know, where do you work? He said, oh, I'm a tax inspector. There are any tax inspectors here, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you get it. Anyway, so, they, they put all these people in jail. And they wait, and the king said, I want to find out why. So he sent his soldiers out looking for that monk. Soon they found him, brought him back to the palace. And they had everybody in there in front of his majesty the king. And his majesty the king said, you've got all these people in big trouble. My best general, the lawyer, this poor farmer, and his family, and this little dog. Why did you get him into trouble? Why did you lie to them? There was no treasure there. The monk said, because, Your Majesty, 
they did not follow the instructions. What do you mean? said the uh, king. Have you ever read, many of you are very strong Buddhists, the Satipatthana Sutta? Where it says at the end, anyone who follows the instructions for seven days will either become a non-returner or fully enlightened. That was said by the Buddha. Have you done a Satipatthana retreat for more than seven days? Were you a non-returner or fully enlightened? Why? Because you did not follow the instructions. That's why. So let's go back to the palace. <laughs> so they asked the old monk, what did they do wrong? And so the old monk said, please your majesty, you come to their, their poor house tomorrow. And I guarantee I'll be there making sure you follow the instructions correctly. And I'm sure you'll find the treasure. And when you do find the treasure, I'd only ask, please, share it four ways equally. One for your own treasury, one for the general, one for the lawyer, and also the other for the family. And that even your quarter share, you would appreciate that would really increase your GDP. How much more would that uh, help this poor family? And it wasn't for the money as much as for the, the answer. You know, why did they make a mistake? So he was there the following morning, his master, the king, with everybody else. And just at the door, he stood at the, the doorway of the poor hut. He looked back at the old man, and the old man, yes, your majesty, correct. As the sun was rising, he picked up the bow and arrow. Correct, your majesty. He raised the bow, put the arrow in, pulled it back, and was ready to shoot. And as the sun parted from the horizon, he turned around to the old monk. Wrong, Your Majesty. That is where they all made a mistake. I never said, shoot the arrow. I said, let it fly. And the king thought for a few moments. He was smart. He knew what to do. He was holding the arrow between his thumb and forefinger. He opened up his thumb and forefinger and the arrow fell right to the ground between his feet where he was standing, where they dug a small hole and found a huge treasure. The king, the lawyer, and the general was happy. The farmer could retire. The wife could do shopping in Oxford Street <laughs> with a platinum credit card. And the kids went to the best private schools. And even the dog. The dog had a new two-story kennel built. <laughs> with air conditioning <laughs> and, and uh, whatever you wanted to order and a little uh, TV with nature channels so you could <laughs> see. <laughs> it's not kidding, it's not cold. <laughs> but it wasn't just to treasure. The most important part was if you are searching for giants, for wisdom, for enlightenment, for meaning. Why is it we shoot the hour of craving? Over there, over there, over there, anywhere but right here where you're sitting. Right now, in your body, no matter how old, sick, whatever race, whatever gender, whatever status, mark and down, lay person, whatever, don't care. Right now, this here is where you find the treasure. What does that really mean? If you aspire for something, if you want something, if you strive for it, 
you are shooting the arrow over in the future. If you are angry, if you are guilty, if you are you're shooting the arrow in the past, the past is gone. Some time ago, when I was studying all types of religion, we had this word called like God, the ultimate reality, whatever it is, is ineffable. I wonder what the heck that word means, ineffable. I know it was in Adam Watts who said, it means you can't F the past. <laughs> I know that people in England do do that, they use the F word to the past. The F in Prime Minister, the F in Brexit, the F in this, the you can't F the past. It's ineffable. <laughs> <laughs> and the government is ineffable. <laughs> <laughs> I just walked out of that. But I thought that's not really, really useful. What is really useful is the past is ineffable. You can't if the past. If something else had happened. If the Brexit vote had gone the other way. If I had drawn this blooming retreat. If I had become a nun and got into this unaccompanied bikini bloody project. That's what ABP means. But you're in it now, so you might as well make the best of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's ineffable, you can't have whatever happened in the past. Which means you let the past go. It's gone. And there you have this present moment. Simple, but so, so powerful. You will find any blockage in your meditation. Any barrier, you'll find it's all when you create a past and future, a real past and future. The five hindrances, I've said this many, many times, you know, karma channel is basically wanting, wanting something. The ill will is when somebody is in your way. It's their fault, blaming others, getting angry. That is the second hindrance, basically. The two parts of wanting. <coughs> Imagine you sat here and gave up all past and future. Just for a few moments, you can't blame anybody, not yourself. That's all in the past, it's gone and finished. You can't change it. No one can change the past except one person. There's one person in the UK who can actually change the past. She's ex amazing at changing the past. It's called Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Doctor Who only exists on the BBC. It doesn't, it doesn't exist in Percy Bridge. <laughs> so, actually, you should. Oh, in the. I guess now I'll tell her another time. But <laughs> at my last retreat, you know, I used to tell the story, I can't tell you now. Why, <laughs> is, <laughs> why is like you know, monks over here, I don't say my arms bar, but I'm travelling, because putting an arms bar in an aircraft, you know, sometimes some monks have been stopped and said, you know, you're not allowed to carry weapons with you. It's not a weapon, it's an arms bar, but you can swing it around and bang something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <Okay. laughs> so, so we just still on the table here. But let me go and see. I think I'm a white on the so I'm one of our monasteries in Thailand. You can actually see we eat out of an arms bar. We do try our best to actually to separate things. But I still remember good old Ajahn Sujito. You know, you know Ajahn Sujito? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When he was a reasonably young monk, <coughs> I remember quite <laughs> there was somebody who actually had a custard truck. 
you know, like burnt custard and stuff. Mm. And they had so much extra, they always had a few extra bags in case there was any breakages or something. So anything extra, he would actually make Chitta's monastery the last stop. We'd always have so much custard every day. <laughs> so, you know, we had a big bowl about this side of custard for about know, maybe a dozen months or so. And so, it was very hard, you know, for one month, so a couple of us. I remember, so holding with Ajahn Sujita while he was dumping out onto people's bowls. <laughs> And he wasn't that sensitive. <laughs> right over the rice, right over the veggies, right over everywhere. Rice all over the bowl. <coughs> he wasn't the most popular monk at that time. <laughs> but, it's happened to me many times. I remember I did have custard of spaghetti. I mean, also had, what was it, the strawberry ice cream over the sanya. <laughs> How many people said, ugh? How many have ever eaten strawberry ice cream on top of the sanya? You don't know what it's like. How many you just think it's going to be awful? You're right, it is awful. <laughs> but, and anyway, but I did find somebody said, well, my last retreat over in Perth, they sort of gave me a photo of apparently Doctor Who. Whenever the new incarnation of Doctor Who appears, they don't know what they like to eat. So they've got an experiment. And one of the Doctor Whos, I haven't seen Doctor Who since I was a kid, the one who wears a bow tie, I don't know who it is, but that's what they said, that he found his favourite food was fish fingers and custard. Apparently, custard with fish fingers. So, I'm not alone. <laughs> it's been strange food, couple of ice cream. Anyway, what, 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 what's, what's this got to do with meditation? <laughs> oh yeah, okay, with the past of Doctor Who. Yeah, but you can't change the past. So that's one of the reasons why. If you just live in the present, there can be no wanting. Because wanting, craving, these are destinations sometime in the future. This is already here, whatever this is. Anger, ill will, needs something in the past to drag into the present and get upset and angry about. When you can let go of the past, this ill will can't happen. Now the next two hindrances of, of tiredness, sleepiness, where does tiredness and sleepiness come from? Exhaustion. We've been struggling so hard to get something or get rid of things. The wanting and the ill will. You're tired. You're exhausted. Your brain has run out of energy. And it's amazing if you just stay in this present moment. No wanting, not trying to get rid of things. You are not wasting energy which means your energy, instead of going into what we'll hear many times in this retreat, the doer, planning, wanting, craving, willing, getting rid of things, all this planning stuff. <coughs> you know, planning this retreat, how exhausted you get? Planning really makes you exhausted. And it never goes right, there's always, you know, things go wrong. But imagine you don't plan at all. No past, no future. The energy start coming back again. As Watson told me about, the restlessness goes. You're peaceful, you're still. That's where you find this treasure. So any of you who come to this retreat and you got sucked in by the advertising slogan, <laughs> <laughs> the natural way to jazz, yeah, jazz, yeah, I want jazz. <laughs> If you come here and want your charmers, forget it. If you want them, you never get them. But the way is there for you. Just be in this moment. No past, no future. You focus on this. You come here to 
let go of things. Let go of the past and the future. Not to gain more things. If you get more things, where are you going to store them? You've already got too much stuff in your apartments, in your houses. That's why we have this self-storage units all over the place. So how are you going to park your charms in the self-storage unit? <laughs> Maybe they're a bit too expensive, but you get a safe deposit box. Four, one of the first judge said, where are you going to store these things? <laughs> these are not attainments, not jewellery, not embellishments, not adornments, which you can show off to your friends. Hey, you want to see my first job? <laughs> <laughs> so never ever think of them as attainments. Instead of regarding what happens when things disappear, when things vanish, when wanting, ill will, tiredness, restlessness disappear. And when you mention the four hindrances, there's a fifth hindrance is when you find out for yourself the doubt gets overcome. What is this deep meditation and why? Why are they happen? You vanish and disappear. It's one of the reasons why the many people get in these jhanas not even know what they're doing. Not even intending them to happen. They flip them. Weird. But you can understand why. They're not wanting anything. They're not aiming for anything. They sit down and they totally let go. People aren't even Buddhists sometimes. They freak a child. By this, they just let go. Sometimes they're in some turmoil. Or they're in some, they just had enough of it. Enough. They just totally abandon it. I'm going over time now, so I'm going to finish with the Ananda method to get jhanas and enlightenment. Ananda was the Buddha's, Buddha's um, attendant for so many years, 25 years. Ananda was living, looking after, and listening to all these great talks, sitting next to the Buddha while all these people, these monks and nuns, were coming up and saying, I've got this enlightenment, I've got... And he hadn't got anything. I hadn't at all. And just three months after the Buddha passed away, they held a big conference. Five hundred arahats to collect all the teachings together, to make sure everything was recorded. They wanted five hundred. But Ananda was not an enlightened being. But they thought, we can't exclude him. He knows so much. He's learned so much. He's got such a great memory. So they made an exception. 499 fully, fully enlightened ones plus Ananda. Now, you don't need to be a psychologist to know how that must feel. <laughs> Imagine that at the end of this retreat, I made the announcement that each one of you were fully enlightened, except for you. <laughs> 80 meditators, 79 enlightened, and you weren't. That would suck big time. <laughs> what the <laughs> What the Especially if you have been coming to meditation for 30, 40, 50 years. And these blow-ins have come for the first time getting the right as it does. But, what would you do? And then he decided to give everything he got the night before. Never slept. Meditated and meditated and meditated. It was enlightened or bust. And believe you me, I've been a monk for a long time. I've seen this enlightenment or bust. It's not two choices, it always is bust. <laughs> always. 
So anyway, but he would try and try and try. And he got the door came out of nowhere, absolutely nowhere. So he gave up. Yes, give up. Renounce, let go. So he said, well, you know, this is another hour or so before the meeting, I might as well take a nap. Yes. Remember this method, the Ananda method. <laughs> it's extremely popular. <laughs> <laughs> so he went to his room and lay down. He gave up, gave up trying. Can't do it. Let it go. Before his head hit the pillow, he was a five hundredth enlightened being. So maybe after lunch or something, if you wanted nothing else for us. <laughs> <laughs> But why? Why did that work? When you let go, you're not looking to attain something in the future. <coughs> you're not worrying about all the failures in the past and how you're not good enough. In the present moment, nothing to do. He stopped. The red lights came. And he stopped. It didn't go anywhere. And that's where enlightenment can be found. Let the ammo of craving, it can crave for good things. Four. Let it fly. It goes right down where you are, where you're sitting. The giants are just stages of letting go. Stages of disappearance. Stages of things vanishing, fading away. <coughs> so, see how much you can vanish, fade away. No want anything. I'm not trying to get somewhere, just to be here and see what happens. And somebody told me, asked me last, about the day before, how can you tell that someone's invited? And for Ananda, how he managed to prove to his friends on the 499 that he was invited, he came late for the meeting. The doors were locked. And he came in through the keyhole. <laughs> That's called making an entrance. <laughs> so if you come enlightened this afternoon, then for this evening's question and answer, wait until the doors are locked and come in. There's another entrance in another keyhole somewhere. I'm sure there's a keyhole there anyway. But just come in through the keyhole. Ah, another enlightened me. But please don't get invited today. Mm -hmm. If you get invited today, what are you going to do for the rest of the week? <laughs> <laughs> just take it slow. <laughs> now, many of you might think this was just another uh, comedy hour. But, much of what I said, very deep. And it is part of the past. I mask this in humor so that you can understand it. So it goes inside. <coughs> so you don't argue with it with your philosophies and your intellect. Humor goes under the bar of the intellect. It goes deep with it. Few of these things you don't have to note down and remember, they're already inside of you. You've been brainwashed. Best of luck. <laughs> so <laughs> so so <laughs> Okie dokie. Pull it out. Oh, it's, uh, it's more meditation now. You can sit here, you can do some walking, or you can try the Ananda method. <laughs> Oh, it's over. the more time you try it, you're increasing the probabilities. <laughs> I should say this. <laughs> okay, have a wonderful day. If you want. Okay, yeah, there will be, will be a bell for lunch. So, don't mind this. And please, if you're hungry, 
don't ring the bell early. There's only, there's supposed to be the bell ringer. Who's the bell ringer? Okay, bell ringer. Okay, because you're the only one allowed to ring. Just, they should wait for the bell and don't sort of think, oh, she must be a bit late. I mean, I'm not going to be here because she's starting. Okay, have a great morning.